Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy 1010. In this video, I am going to provide a basic framework of current academic cosmology, which I will not be grading anyone on this information on any of the exams. I don't expect you to, you know, you don't, you won't be tested on this knowledge, but it is going to help you understand the knowledge that you will be tested on in our textbook, a lot of which deals directly with the nature of space and time. So it seems, uh, considering especially that I, I got my PhD focusing on the parallels between current cosmology and philosophy and psychology, <clears throat> it just would seem inadequate if I didn't at least draw some basic comparisons to what the philosophical texts we'll be reading in our book uh, compare what they say about space and time to what you will learn about space and time if you were to take a class in, in physics or cosmology in academia today. Uh, I don't know the higher mathematics. I know a little bit about them but I know what the physicists who discovered these theories, like Einstein and Heisenberg, Wolfgang Pauli, I know what they, they drew philosophical comparisons between their discoveries and the nature of consciousness. Um, so it just, I think, will help you understand the texts more and understand their relevance to life today. You might think, well, these are old texts. These people didn't really have science, so everything they say is based on sort of a primitive understanding of the cosmos. So why should I you know, take the time to really absorb what they're trying to say? But in light of current cosmology, 20th century into the 21st century cosmology, it reveals that the more ancient cosmologies, such as the Hindu cosmology and Plato's cosmology, uh, were a lot closer to... There, there's a lot more similarities to those ancient cosmologies and 20th century cosmology than there was between those ancient cosmologies and Sir Isaac Newton's cosmology, which had a revolutionary um, addendums added to it. It's a good theory, but at scales that are very large or very small, it doesn't work anymore. And the worldview from those perspectives of physics is a lot different than the worldview that was based upon Newton's cosmology, which is, <clears throat> in a lot of instances, materialism. Everything is made of little bits of matter floating in three dimensions of space over enormous amounts of time. That is an ancient philosophy. Democritus had it. We'll be reading Lucretius, the Roman, uh, someone from ancient Rome who was commenting on Democritus's philosophy. Uh, that <coughs> philosophy was undermined with the 20th century physics of uh, special relativity, general relativity, quantum mechanics, and string theory. All of them undermine the idea of existence is ultimately made of empty space and little ball bearings of solid matter. And uh, I'll explain in this video why. And then when I start in the next videos to get into the readings in our text, and I'll refer back <clears throat> to some of the information I'll be sharing in this video, and then you'll understand why I went to the trouble to create this video. Because, for example, in the next reading, the first reading, the Kapha Upanishad, they talk about space and time and the nature of the soul, which they described as being a combination of Atman and Brahman. And the nature of Atman and Brahman, it's very similar, as we will see, to the particle wave nature of the atom as described by quantum mechanics. So that's just an example of why it will help you understand the readings down the road if you can put them in a very basic framework of current cosmology. So it starts uh, I'll just describe Isaac Newton's cosmology and how that gradually metamorphosized through relativity theory and quantum mechanics and special relativity. Uh, so according to Isaac Newton's worldview, the universe consists of three 
rigid dimensions of empty space, up, down, left, right, backward, and forward, and one dimension of forward flowing time, constantly flowing forward at the same rate, regardless of different observers' relative reference frames, regardless of their different speeds through space. Time flows on at the same rate for everyone, everywhere in this huge arena of three rigid dimensions of empty space, which is occupied by little atoms of matter, little solid, insentient bits of soulless matter. So, and those little bits of matter, Sir Isaac Newton worked out his theory of gravity, they're attracted to each other by a force that he called gravity. And he provided mathematical equations to describe that force, which are extremely effective at predicting the movements of objects through space, like planets around the sun, and cannonballs through the air, and you know, putting rockets into outer space. It can calculate those trajectories very well using uh, Newton's theory of gravity, which is based on his theory of space and time. Then a man named James Clerk Maxwell discovered that electricity and magnetism well, he worked out what another man, Faraday, discovered. He worked out the mathematical equations. Electricity and magnetism are actually the same thing. It's another force. In addition to the force of gravity, there's the electromagnetic force. And it travels at a very specific speed. And according to his equations, it, it implies that the speed of light never changes. It's an absolute constant speed, um, which is strange. So... Einstein then came along and said, well, if nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, it's an absolute speed. Yet, according to uh, Isaac Newton's theory of gravity, the force of gravity travels infinitely fast because, for example, the Earth is revolving around the sun as if there was some kind of a string tethering the Earth to the sun. If the force of gravity, which is this invisible connecting mechanism, which would just be turned off, you would expect the Earth to fling out of its trajectory in a straight line immediately. That would imply an instantaneous connection between the sun and the earth through the force of gravity, which is faster than the speed of light. So Einstein said, Newton's theory of gravity must be wrong if the speed of light is an absolute unchanging speed limit of the universe. So he said, well, if speed equals distance traveled divided by the time spent traveling, and if the speed of light is absolute and can never, it never changes, you always measure a speed of a light beam to be traveling at the same speed regardless of how fast you're going or how fast the source of light is going. So if the speed of light is always the same, then space and time must be malleable because the speed is distance divided by time. So speed's always the same. If there's any change in anything, it must be between distance or space and time. And so the most important point for our class about that discovery is, according to Einstein's special theory of relativity, the past, the present, and the future of all of the points in space all coexist in what he called space-time. Just like behind me still exists even though I'm here, and in front of me exists even though I'm here, Space and time are interwoven, so the past still exists and the future still exists. And what appears to me to be the past from someone else moving at a different speed in a different direction, that will appear to them to be either in the present or not yet happened and is still waiting to happen in the future. There's a lot of details behind there, but the main thing again, as will become, it will become apparent why this is important for philosophy is if the past, the present, and the future coexist, then there is or appears to be an eternal realm, which is an, a big point of contention between different philosophers. So then from special relativity, Einstein next developed general relativity, which was his theory that what Isaac Newton called the force of gravity is actually the curvature of the fabric of space-time. You've probably seen videos where they describe this 
general relativity theory of gravity by having a trampoline, putting a bowling ball in the middle, and then rolling maybe billiard balls around the indentation created by the bowling ball. That's, for example, why the Earth revolves around the Sun. The Sun creates a huge indentation in the fabric of space-time, and the Earth just follows its natural trajectory, which happens to be rotating around this indentation. If the Sun disappeared, that indentation in the fabric of space-time would ripple outward at the speed of light, according to the general relativity, not infinitely fast, like Isaac Newton's theory predicts, but at a very fast but not infinite speed of light, so it would take a while for that rippling wave of space-time to reach the Earth, to knock it out of its orbit, it would, and it would take about eight minutes, because that wave of space-time would travel at the speed of light. That's how Einstein solved the problem of Newton's theory of gravity, which appears to travel infinitely fast between two objects, and what James Clerk Maxwell discovered that the speed of light is absolute. Okay, so from that general theory of relativity, however, came an unexpected kind of a monster for the world of physics to deal with. And it was um, for the first exact solution to Einstein's field equations for general relativity, Carl Schwarzschild, he provided these mathematical solutions while fighting in the trenches of World War I, and what he came up with was the idea of a black hole. That according to Einstein's theory, if you condensed enough mass into a small enough space, eventually it would contract indefinitely into a single point of infinite density. And according to general relativity, if something was infinitely heavy, it's the same as it's traveling infinitely fast that point of infinite density would contain all points of space and time within it. It would furthermore surround itself with an event horizon beyond which even light could not escape once it's fallen in through that event horizon toward the singularity. Nothing can escape. And Einstein said, oh, that's a very strange hobgoblin that you've discovered in my theories, but Mother Nature would, wouldn't allow it. Just because the mathematics implies it's possible, doesn't mean it's actually happening. And furthermore, according to this theory, space itself should be contracting. Every bit of matter in the universe should be attracting itself to every other bit. Um, and this was also related to the theory that the universe is currently expanding. And it, in an, in the most important point for our class is that according to general relativity, not only can black holes form with these singularities, but the whole universe, which is currently expanding, was therefore in the ancient past contracted into a single point of infinite density, a singularity. So everything comes from this point of infinite brightness that you can't even see for the reasons of, for example, in a black hole, you can't see a singularity because the light that's inside a black hole can't escape from the inward tidal flow of space-time, which surpasses the speed of light. As we go through these texts, I will be comparing certain philosophical concepts to that idea of a singularity. For example, the Hindu concept of Atman is very similar to the singularity. So is Plato's ultimate idea of the good. Uh, so that's why I'm explaining it a little bit here. The problem in 20th century cosmology was that after Einstein's theory of general relativity, which he developed in 1915, in 1927, some physicists discovered a whole other world of physics at the micro level, and that's quantum physics, quantum mechanics. Uh, and the the two most important points to keep in mind about quantum mechanics for our class <clears throat> are first the particle wave paradox of the smallest units of being in the material world and the idea of quantum entanglement. Uh, the first point there, the wave particle paradox, it came about because of what is known as the two slit experiment. And I included a video in the YouTubes 
YouTube section under our, if you hit content at the top of our web page, and then you'll see the column of categories on the left. One of them says YouTube. If you click on that, the non-required YouTube videos will be there. And one of them is a little cartoon about the particle wave paradox and the double slit experiment. And very briefly, this is what they discovered. When they shot quantum particles like electrons through a wall with two slits in it at a recording wall behind that, the recording wall would measure those little bits, those electrons, it would always measure them as little bits, little, little particle hits, but if they were observing which of the two slits the electrons were going through, the particles would align themselves directly behind the two slits, as you'll see in the video. However, if they were not looking at which of the two slits the electrons went through, then when the detector screen detected the electrons, sometimes they would be directly behind the two slits, sometimes they'd be way off to the left, way off to the right. The pattern that they observed was the same pattern you would have seen if a wave had gone through the two slits and then created two little waves that then interfere with each other as they ripple forward, creating light and dark bands where the two waves um, amplify each other. You would see a light band, and where they counteract each other, you'd see a dark band. Similarly, with this two-slit experiment, those little particles, after a while, they would gradually create the pattern of a wave, as if a wave had gone through. So it turned out that the electron behaves like a particle if you observe it. If you observe which slit it goes through, it goes through just like a particle. And we'll hit the detector screen right behind the slit, just like little bullets from a machine gun would have done. If you don't observe which of the two slits the, the particle goes through, it goes through as what they call a wave of probability. And then it is detected by the detector screen as a little particle. So at the micro level of the, of the world, things are particles when you observe them, and when you're not directly observing them, they behave like these waves of probability. They travel like liquid waves, but it's not liquid. It's a wave of the statistical likelihood for where you might see a particle were you to observe it, most likely at the peak of the wave, but there's a slight possibility you could see that particle out to the stretches of infinity because the wave levels off but never quite become uh, zero. At any rate, that particle wave paradox of the quantum world has parallels as I mentioned before, with the Atman-Brahman paradox of the soul discussed in the Katha Upanishad, which will be our first reading. And um, I'll talk about that when we get to that chapter. So now the problem is the physics of quantum mechanics, at, which measures things at the micro level, cannot be used to describe things at the macro level described by general relativity, and you cannot use general relativity to describe things at the micro level. There's one universe, well, there's maybe an infinite number of parallel universes, but however many universes there are, you would think there's one law of physics, and that you could use the same law of physics to describe nature at any scale. But that does not seem to be the case, but physicists want to discover how these two laws of physics can be unified, and that is what string theorists try to do. And very briefly, string theory says the little particles that quantum mechanics talks about are actually these thin threads of energy. And there are extra dimensions of space beyond the three that we can perceive, but they are curled up at each point of three-dimensional space in these peculiar geometrical shapes, kalabi yau manifolds. And the strings wrap around those compactified shapes of space, and the way they are wrapped around those shapes of space determines the laws of quantum mechanics. So it's a, apparently, to a physicist, it's a beautiful theory because it elegantly, mathematically unites general relativity and quantum mechanics. Um, the problem is these threads and these compactified dimensions of space are so small that there's no current 
technology capable of measuring them. So if it's not empirically observable, is it really science? That's a philosophical question. But here is one of the conundrums of physics that string theory helped to solve. And it's a, another video that I included through the wormhole with Morgan Freeman, The Riddle of Black Holes. It discusses the black hole war between Leonard Susskind and Stephen Hawking, who just died this year. Uh, Stephen Hawking said, oh, according to um, relativity theory, if information falls through the event horizon of a black hole, it's lost from the universe. You'll never be able to retrace what fell past that event horizon. Leonard Susskind said, well, that violates a law of physics called the law of information conservation, which is more fundamental than the law of conservation of energy and mass, according to Leonard Susskind. Um, and the way he solved this problem was he said, here's what happens. As information falls towards the black hole, these threads of energy of which it's made, which are rapidly vibrating under the gravity of the event horizon, they slow down and they smear out around the event horizon. And then those little bits of information which are captured by these threads that are smeared out around the event horizon are released back into the universe by the outgoing Hawking radiation, which I'm not going to describe right now. But furthermore, in the same way that the Big Bang is an inside-out black hole expanding from a singularity instead of contracting toward one, the horizon of the cosmos, where space is expanding at the speed of light, contains all of the information from the past, present, and future of the interior of the universe at each point of the surrounding sphere, like a holographic film plate. This is what the physicist, string theorist from Stanford University, Leonard Susskind says. And that information then radiates back into the universe with the cosmic microwave background radiation, the echo of the Big Bang, and creates the hologram of three-dimensional space that we perceive. So the past, the present, and the future are all interwoven at each point of this surrounding sphere from which radiates the temporal unfolding of all of that information that we perceive, like a cinematic hologram, to use Leonard Susskind's terms. So that theory <clears throat> unites quantum mechanics and general relativity, and it is also extremely similar to some of the ancient philosophies, again, specifically Hindu philosophy and Plato's cosmology. As a famous physicist, Brian Greene from Columbia University pointed out, this is Leonard Susskind's theory of the holographic cosmic horizon creating the illusion of three-dimensional space is very similar to Plato's cave allegory, which we'll be studying in our class. So that is the end of this summary of academic cosmology, within which I think you'll be able to appreciate these introductory philosophical readings a lot more. And the next video will be the f uh, my summary of the first reading required for our text, which is the Katha Upanishad.